Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining our program on creating more good in your pet's bowl with Open Farm Sonia Citito. My name is Greg Boyer, and I have the pleasure of working in the operations team for Cherry Brook Pet Supplies. Sonia is the Mid-Atlantic Territory Manager for Open Farm and has worked in the pet nutrition uh, for five years. In her role, she helps match independent uh, pet specialty uh, retailers like Cherry Brook with premium nutritional solutions for their pets. She is a mom of three dogs and passionate about nutrition, clean nutrition, uh, natural, and uh, ethical and sustainable nutrition. Cherry Brook believes education is critical for pet owners to make informed decisions about nutrition. So we are pleased to bring informative programs like this to our customers. This presentation will be about 30 minutes long, and Sonia will be happy to answer any questions you may have at the conclusion of the presentation. Please use the chat feature on the right-hand side of your screen to submit questions and share comments. Sonia? Sonia, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Sonia? Okay, it appears we're having some uh, audio trouble. Hold, bear with me one second, please. Hi everyone, sorry about that delay. <laughs> thank you so much for joining me. Um, I'd like to give a big thank you to Start Out for attending tonight and a big thank you to Cherrybrook for hosting this webinar and bringing such valuable educational content to pet parents like you. By being here, it shows that you're a caring dog parent who wants to do the best for their canine companion. So hello. Thank you so much. Um, as Greg alluded, I'm Sonia Sestito, and I am a territory manager for Open Farm. The three little pooches you see on the screen here are my three little rescue dogs. That's Ali, Coco, and Juju. Hopefully they don't make a uh, noisy appearance during this presentation. <laughs> um, but I'm very passionate, as Greg said, about nutrition that doesn't compromise my values. And I'm just a huge believer in the nurturing, healing powers of whole, natural, and superfoods. So I want to kick things off tonight by getting to know my audience a little better. So can you tell me in the chat box where you're joining us from? and whether you have a dog, cat, or both. So feel free to share more details about your furry children as we go through the presentation, of course. But yeah, hopefully we have people joining us from all over. And it's just great to see so many people that are interested in expanding their knowledge base to provide their pets with a longer, happier, healthier life. So cool. It looks like d three dogs. We have someone from New Jersey, Seattle. Awesome. Diverse audience. Very, very cool. So just before we get started, I want to give a little disclaimer that I need to state uh, this presentation is strictly for presentation purposes, as I'm not a veterinarian. And of course, always consult, consult your veterinarian for recommendations, especially if you have a pet with special needs or medical conditions. So and now that we've gotten that out of the way, I would like to get a pulse on my audience tonight with our first poll question. 
So please tell me, is this your first time attending a pet nutrition seminar? Yes or no? I think as a pet parent, it's super important to, again, expand our knowledge base to keep them alive as long as possible as they're such loyal companions and have them in tip-top shape. So it's awesome to see that it shows that we have a mixed response here. It looks like more people have than haven't. So kudos to you guys for expanding on the knowledge that you already have. And it's also great to see some new people in here um, that are kind of just diving in. So awesome stuff. You guys have some lucky fur friends. <laughs> So here's a brief outline of what we'll cover tonight. My goal is really to make this worth your time by sharing knowledge on how to build the best bowl possible for your pet. So your questions are encouraged throughout the presentation, but I will hold off on answering any until our Q&A session begins once the presentation wraps up. So feel free to write any questions as they come up in the chat box. So here's our agenda. What we'll be going over are the benefits of feeding a diverse diet, the elements of a varied diet, the many different feeding formats that are available, and then finally putting it all together. So how to build a better bowl followed by our Q&A session. So time for poll question number two. And the question is, how do you primarily feed your pet? A, dry, B, wet, C, freeze dried raw or dehydrated, D, frozen raw or gently cooked or home cooked? So I personally like to do a mixture to uh, give a little variety. So I typically do a base of some salmon dry food with some salmon stew. I love adding freeze dried raw, which we'll talk about all of these feeding formats in greater detail and topping it off with some bone broth and adding some things of my own like steamed broccoli or steamed carrots. So great, it looks like a nice mixture of feeding methods here. I really love this because bowl building is something that can really be incorporated into any feeding regimen. So we have people kind of all over the board. So this is really great. So let's get straight to the benefits. As you can see, there are so many benefits of feeding a varied diet through building a better bowl. So first and foremost, it keeps things interesting. By giving your pets variety and changing things up, it keeps them enticed, especially when you have a pet that is maybe a picky eater and doesn't really eat things consistently. It enhances overall nutrition in the sense that there's really no such thing as one perfect food. So, by feeding diversely and rotationally, it really helps to ensure a diverse nutritional profile. It certainly boosts palatability, and it also may prevent intolerance, allergies, and sensitivities by reducing overexposure to proteins, which we'll dive a little bit deeper into a little bit later. Boosting palatability again for picky eaters. And palatability is more than just taste or smell, but it's four different things. So you have smell, taste, texture, and appearance. And when it comes to building a more robust gut flora, we'll talk more about this as well, but your gut health as a human or an animal is so incredibly important to your overall health and immunity. And by eating a varied diet and getting different types of bacteria from different ingredients, it helps to build that robust gut flora. And this is especially important for your pooch because nearly 90% of your dog's immune system is actually in their gut. So proper gut function is, of course, again, imperative to overall health and immunity, but it really affects digestibility, immune system, organ function, and overall ability for your pet to thrive. So of course, the saying goes, if you've ever heard it, the second brain is in the gut. So the more diverse, healthy, 
gut bacteria, the better. Another great benefit is that it adds more moisture, which moisture is so critical to proper bodily function. And we'll dive deeper into this as well. And finally, fruits and veggies can increase fiber intake. So this is especially great for dogs needing to lose weight as higher fiber foods help them to feel satiated for longer. One of my two chihuahuas unfortunately puts on weight super easily. I recently got back from a trip and my dog sitter overfed her. So I love adding steamed broccoli to her bowl to help keep her feeling full while not overfeeding. So now I would like to pose another poll question for you. And my question is, tell me, would you like to eat the same thing every day, day in and day out? Yes or no? I almost contemplated adding a C only if it's pizza. <laughs> so it looks like the overwhelming majority of results point to no, <laughs> which is what I expected. I can certainly attest to this, having made many large batches of food to create less cooking over the course of a week only to find that I quickly tire of eating chili over and over again. <laughs> so that leads me to the, the saying that variety is the spice of life. So not only for us, but for our furry companions as well. So now we're gonna dive into the elements of a varied diet. So following is a list of complete foods. This means that a food is complete and balanced, meaning it covers all essential nutrients and can be fed as a standalone meal. I've put an asterisk next to a few of these as they may not always be complete and balanced and may only be intended for use as a mixer or topper. So always be sure to check the packaging and make sure it's complete and balanced. So this ranges from dry food, dehydrated and freeze-dried raw, wet food, frozen raw, and frozen gently cooked, as well as refrigerated cooked food. So lots of options for complete feeding formats. Secondly, our complementary foods. So these are foods that typically aren't complete and balanced, but they're intended to complement an already balanced diet. So first, Goat's milk is a superfood that is full of vitamins, minerals, trace elements, electrolytes, enzymes, proteins, and fatty acids. I've placed an asterisk next to this one as some formulations of goat's milk are considered complete foods. Um, kefir is a really powerful probiotic supplement, and of course probiotics are live healthy bacteria. Dairy products can be great as they're naturally very taurine rich in which taurine is an essential amino acid that's found only in animal tissue and plays a vital role in maintaining cardiac function. Bone broth, which is something that you may use for yourself, is excellent as it's full of collagen. It's an essential, which is an essential building block that provides structure for many parts of the body. Bone broth also brings with it benefits of supporting immunity, healthy gut flora, and can even help with cleaner teeth and gums, which dental care is also always a super important issue for our pets, especially with February being Dental Health Month. <laughs> so superfoods is a particular topic that gets me really excited as there are just so many that nature has gifted us with and the possibilities are nearly endless. So just to name a few, you have things like cinnamon and turmeric, which power, carry really powerful anti-inflammatory properties. You have salmon oil, which is rich in omega-3 fatty acids, DHA and EPA. And then you have fruits and veggies, which this is such a great easy add-on that you can do at your own home, so highly accessible and economical additions to your dog's bowl. So I particularly love leafy greens like spinach and kale and berries, which are rich in antioxidants. Pumpkin is an excellent source of fiber. 
You just want to be sure that the fruits and veggies that you are going to use are deemed safe for your pets to consume. So a few things that you want to steer away from are grapes, onions, avocados, and cherries. So just always be absolutely certain that it's safe. So rotational feeding is another great way to just keep interest and again, build overall immunity, carrying a host of benefits in which you'll notice that Lots of those listed here are identical to those of feeding a varied diet in general that we went over in the beginning of the presentation. So to build on the topic of possibly preventing allergies and sensitivities, many food allergies and intolerances can be attributed to repeated and continued exposure to a certain protein source. For example, chicken is the number one most common protein allergens in dogs. Over time, a pet's body can create a negative immune reaction to a certain protein. So therefore, by rotating protein sources, we may be able to reduce the frequency of food allergies and intolerances. Open Farm and some other brands offer many protein options across their lineups, making it easy to feed, ro feed proteins rotationally. So just as a general suggestion, when, when switching to a new brand of food, it's always recommended to transition to that new food gradually over the course of between five to 10 days. If your pet tends to be very sensitive, it's recommended to transition more slowly and add a probiotic supplement or pumpkin to prevent any digestive upset. With Open Farm, there's no need to transition in between proteins when feeding rotationally within the same product category. So moving on, the importance of moisture. Moisture is incredibly important as it makes up roughly 65% or more of a dog's body. The body cell walls, tissue, and fluids are primarily made of water. So therefore, water is critical for proper bodily function and supporting overall health. Lack of moisture in our pet's diets can lead to de dehydration and kidney issues. And when our pets don't get sufficient moisture, their organ systems are limited in their ability to carry out their role in immunity, digestion, and all other bodily functions. As feeding our pets has evolved largely based on convenience, Dry food has become the most common way to feed our pets. Now, dry food certainly isn't bad, and certainly not all are created equal, but dry food typically only contains between 5 and 10% moisture. So, <laughs> maybe you've had this experience, but if you've ever eaten a mouthful of saltine crackers without a glass of water nearby, uh, that's kind of what you could think of in terms of feeding a dog or a cat dry food with adding no moisture to it. Another great benefit is that adding moisture may enhance palatability, especially when you're using a dairy or a bone broth supplement. But even if you just let dry food soak or rehydrate in warm water before serving, it can make the... Um, natural smells come out and make it much more enticing to your animal. So based on this, the more high moisture foods in a dog's diet, the better. And this includes typically frozen, fresh, and wet. As a result, you'll often find that incorporating more moisture into your pet's diet typically leads them to drink less water. So now we'll take a slightly deeper dive into complete feeding formats So we'll start with dry food. Dry food has its definitely has some major pros in that it's very energy dense, it's convenient, there are formulas available for all different life stages and dietary needs if you want to get something pretty specific, and it's definitely the most economical, especially if you're feeding a larger size dog. 
The other nice thing is that there are so many brands to choose from. And again, with not one food being absolutely perfect, it gives you a plethora of options to choose from. However, when you talk about moisture, dry food, as we discussed, is very low moisture. So it does require adding hydration to help a dog digest it properly and get as many nutrients as possible. But dry food is the number one feeding format with roughly 80% of all pet parents feeding this to their pets. Freeze dried raw and dehydrated are excellent, more minimally processed forms of feeding uh, that you can use as a base as well or adding to your dry food. This is very meaty with uh, some of the highest meat content out there. You'll also have lower carbs, but like dry food, you'll also have some lower moisture. Another pro to these feeding formats is that they are highly digestible and also highly palatable. So again, great for picky eaters. Some of the highest moisture of all is wet food which is really nice because it's very convenient in that most of them are complete and balanced. Many brands use human grade ingredients and they're actually even made in human grade food facilities. Another nice bonus is that lots of them do contain bone broth, so you almost get a two in one. It's certainly easier to digest than dry food and it is highly palatable. This is also a great option if you have a senior dog like me that is missing some of their teeth <laughs> it's easy for them to eat so getting to the frozen realm which would be a raw or a gently cooked frozen raw is of course going to be the most minimally processed with the highest meat content and some of the lowest carb levels that are there it's typically quite high in moisture. It's very easy to digest, highly digestible, and also incredibly palatable. And gently cooked is a nice option if for whatever reason you don't feel comfortable feeding raw or you're worried about the bacteria or your dog may not be able to tolerate it based on where they're at. So we'll finally get to the burning question at hand, which is, how do I build a better bowl? <laughs> so there's really not much to say here as it's really, really simple. So the first step is to choose your base. So starting with a complete base feeding format, preferably from a line that offers a variety of proteins through which you can rotate. So again, rotational feeding, is awesome. Next, you would add your mixers, toppers, or superfoods. This can include your um, store-bought items and even your homemade items as well. Number three, extremely important, essential to life and proper bodily function, add moisture. Whether you're going to add some warm to hot water to the food first to let it rehydrate a bit, especially if it's dry, or even if you're feeding something like a frozen that does have slightly higher moisture, it's always great to add moisture. And last but not least, serve it up. Look at this beautiful bowl. If I was a dog, I would totally want to eat that. It looks enticing. You have a variety of smells, tastes, and textures. It will keep them interested and it'll keep them coming back for more. So before we wrap up, I'd like to share a few fairly important tips. So number one is when you're adding to your pet's bowl, be sure to reduce the base feeding medium to compensate for additional items. Because of course, if you're feeding, let's say a quarter cup, each meal per day. Um, you want to reduce that a little bit if you're adding something like a freeze-dried raw in because they all come together to create the total caloric intake that you're giving to your dog. Next is take caution not to overfeed probiotic supplements 
as they tend to be quite concentrated and too much may cause digestive upset. So it's recommended to um, pay attention to the manufacturer's recommended recommended feeding guidelines and to start um, to start slow and with a smaller amount. Another super important tip is to always ensure any packaged products you use are fit for pet, pet consumption. So for instance, any bone broths that you'd find at the grocery store may contain spices like onion and garlic, which are dangerous for pets. Additionally, with any perishable items that have a time frame by which you need to use them, um, especially animal-derived products, that a great way to prevent food waste is to freeze liquid supplements if you won't use them before their recommended refrigerated shelf life is reached. And some pet parents even like to portion their thawed refrigerated supplements out, thawed into usable smaller quantities to ensure freshness and to make it more convenient. Regarding veggies, because many veggies contain very thick cell walls, which can sometimes be difficult for dogs to digest, a great way to prepare them is to steam them, which also helps to maintain nutritional integrity. Um, steaming is one of the best ways to, lit to lightly cook a fruit or veggie. Um, it makes it very, very palatable. And again, you're ensuring where if you might boil something, you're not going to have all that nutrient runoff. So before we head into our Q&A session, I'd just like to share some really quick info on Open Farm. So Open Farm offers a complete lineup of dietary solutions from kibble to frozen gently cooked. It's very diverse. And all recipes are comprised of only humanely raised meats, wild ocean caught fish, non-GMO fruits and veggies, and rich superfoods. Open Farm proudly creates food that is nutritious and delicious for your pets, but also kind to the planet. And Cherry Bread carries a really broad range of Open Farm dog products and can easily special order any products you're interested in that they may not stock. So if you're attending this webinar live, you'll get some exclusive Open Farm offers delivered to your inbox post-webinar just keep in mind that these are redeemable only at Cherry Book stores and can be used in store or online. So thank you so much. That wraps up my presentation. And to get into the Q&A session, I do have some primer questions. You, of course, are free to ask any questions um, that may come up. Um, Greg, can I? Can you, sure. I hear you? So, okay. Wonderful. All right. So the first question we had here was, how can I help my seven-month-old rat terrier gain weight? She is only 7.5 pounds. That is super tiny, and rat terriers are absolutely adorable. I'm a sucker for, like, rat terriers, Papillons, Pomeranians, any dog like that. So I would recommend looking at something very high calorie, and especially since you said puppy, um, whether if you're interested in feeding a dry food, a puppy formula is going to be naturally higher in fat and protein, but you can also look at feeding mediums again that are higher in fat and calories. So something higher in calories, for instance, uh, would be something like a freeze dried raw or a frozen gently cooked anything like a frozen raw is typically going to be on the leaner side, but depending on the protein, you can have a higher um, fat content. So I would recommend um, specifically consulting Cherry Brook to help steer you in the right direction based on what you'd like to feed and just tell them that you need something with higher fat. They are nutritional experts and very happy to help. Thank you. <laughs> uh, all right, next question. Can the shelf life of a hard food be extended with freezing? That's a really great question and something that I honestly don't know the answer to. So, Greg, can you please take down this question so I can follow up? Absolutely. We can respond offline. Thank right, next, you. No problem. Uh, how should I introduce supplements into my pet's diet? 
Sure. So always ref always reference the manufacturer's feeding guidelines. And of course, it's going to vary. But in terms of what Open Farm recommends on the kefir or goat's milk, it's generally up to two ounces per 20 pounds of body weight per day. Um, and for something like a bone broth, roughly two tablespoons per 10 pounds of body weight per day. So again, especially if it's a dairy product, maybe even start with a little bit less slowly just to ensure that they, um, there's not an adverse reaction to it. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, how do you make a grain dog food taste really good for a picky eater? <laughs> so there's a numbers there's a number of um, ways to do that so again we talked about palatability kind of having the four facets to it so a huge component of that is the quality of the ingredients so just like if you were eating something we know that eating something fresh and whole like whole foods are always going to be more flavorful than something processed or um, something that's been um, altered from its natural state. So looking to a food that's using fresh meat, uh, cuts of meat that are fit for human consumption, like you would buy for yourself at a grocery store, and also the fruits and veggies as well. Um, fresh and whole versus, you know, something that's maybe dehydrated powder, a big 50 pound sack going into the food. Again, emphasis on human grade ingredients, super high quality of meat, everything going in fresh and whole. Um, I think that's the best way to boost palatability. But again, also like we talked about feeding rotationally. So um, again, if you are feeding within the same brand and the same category, so grain free, typically there's no need to rotate through protein. So by switching up the protein, it enhances that palatability. And some people even like to have, you know, two formulas on hand at any given time of different proteins to kind of create a mixed bowl just to give more variety. Okay, good. Uh, next question. Are dairy products safe for pets? I'm assuming they're talking about cow milk. Yeah, yeah, so like a, a cow milk or a goat milk. So yes, unless your pet has an issue with dairy products, um, goat's milk products are naturally very low in lactose and um, the alpha S1 milk protein, also known as casein, um, which generally makes for easy digestion for goat's milk. But if your pet does have an issue with lactose, consider trying a lactose-free cow's milk product. Um, so cow's milk products, are made lactose free if it is of course a lactose free um, product just by adding an enzyme called lactase to the product which breaks down the lactose. And I guess another couple differences to point out between cow and goat's milk is that cow's milk is also slightly lower in fat and calories um, than goat's milk. All right, next question. What about grain versus grain free? Don't dogs need some grain? So this is a great question and something that I get asked quite often. And I defer to um, nutrition isn't a one size fits all approach. So what works well for my body may not work the best for your body. So it's great to, again, feed a um, variety. So I know some people that will alternate between grain free and grain in, but I guess I would ask, what the concern, if there's a specific concern. Um, many, um, I've had my dogs on a grain-free diet typically for quite a while, but if I'm running low on grain-free and I have some, I always have some extra food on hand of ancient grain, I will rotate it into the diet periodically. Um, I think it really depends how your dog does on one versus the other. Um, if you're looking for something, you know, without peas or legumes. Um, those are typically found in a grain-free formula, which again, they are not bad. What you just want to look for in that formula is that you're getting the vast majority of your protein from a meat or a fish source versus the plant-based sources, because we know that animal ingredients are easier for dogs and cats to digest and just more bioavailable when it comes to nutrients. So, um, and if you want something that's 
um, maybe free of uh, potatoes as well. You could look for that. Um, for instance, we offer some ancient grain formulas, which are completely pea, potato, uh, legume free. And um, naturally, because there are legumes taken out of the formula, you're getting a slightly higher percentage of protein from a meat or a fish source. So again, it's not that one is good or one, one is bad. It's more so about your individual pet um, and kind of what you feel the most comfortable with. Great. Our next question. I've been feeding a uh, Maggie farm dog turkey frozen food every day. So this has me really thinking about giving more variety. What would you suggest? So you said open farm uh, uh, frozen Ma turkey? Maggie, Maggie farms dog turkey. and says it's a, a frozen food. Okay. Um, I'm not quite familiar with the brand, but frozen is certainly a great way to feed. You're already feeding something that's going to be more minimally processed and naturally higher in moisture. So I think a great way to complement a frozen diet is definitely adding some kind of superfood source of moisture. So like a kefir or goat's milk or a bone broth. And then even adding something like... Um, if it's not a raw product, some freeze-dried raw um, that you can sprinkle within it. And again, in your kitchen, you'd be surprised at how many things that you can incorporate into the diet, whether it's some spices like cinnamon and turmeric or coconut oil or salmon oil or chia or flax um, or even just some fruit, fruits and veggies. So that's a great question. And again, uh, bowl building can be done regardless of the base method of feeding, whether you're doing more conventional dry food or you're doing something like uh, frozen. Sounds good. Uh, next question. Is it okay to feed a puppy a varied diet? Yes, absolutely. And in fact, it's encouraged to feed a varied diet from the beginning uh, to prevent overexposure to a single protein. Again, creating a more diverse nutrient profile and building a robust, robust gut flora. Just like a lot of pediatricians will say for children, feed them a lot of different things from the very beginning to prevent those intolerances, allergies, and sensitivities. Absolutely. Start feeding a varied diet as early on as possible. Okay. Next one. Uh, should I incorporate supplements if my dog is eating a quality dog food? Sure. So if you're feeding a complete and balanced food, um, any food that you, of course, would be purchasing from a Cherry Brook is going to meet all AFCO nutritional requirements. So they're meeting their nutritional needs. So it's not necessarily... Um, necessary <laughs> to supplement unless there's something in particular that you want to target. So if your dog is maybe a little bit older and you want to add something preventative for hip and joint support, you could add something like a um, glucosamine chondroitin supplement. If you feel your dog might have a dull skin or coat, adding some kind of oil like a salmon oil or a coconut oil can be something great to add. Um, and again, I always say you can't go wrong with bone broth or dairy supplements because the dairy supplements are just going to be great for adding um, probiotics, which are so imperative to overall health. And the bone broth is going to be rich in collagen and super, super palatable. Okay. Next question. Uh, what are some good veggies for dogs? So leafy greens are great, like kale and spinach, um, broccoli, carrots. You can also give celery. Um, you want to st typically steer clear of mushrooms. Of course, wild mushrooms can be very dangerous, but I think it's better to just stay away from them altogether. Um, you could also steam some potatoes. So it's really, it's, it's, you have lots of options at your fingertips, which is really, really nice. Okay. Next question. Is raw feeding good for senior dogs? So I think it's a highly individualized thing, especially if you have a senior dog. I would recommend that it is 
best to consult your veterinarian um, or maybe if you um, want to follow up with Cherry Brook and give them a little bit more information about your senior dog. I know that raw food can be excellent for all life stages and it is absolutely the most biologically appropriate way to feed. Um, but I would just, you know, check first, are there any underlying conditions? Um, is their immune system weakened or anything like that? Do they have any uh, medical issues or anything that you know, raw food may be difficult for their body to handle or the bacteria might be a concern, but I think it's a really um, one-off uh, situation. So I would encourage you to check in with Cherry Brook and give them a little bit more information and they can steer you in the right direction. Uh, related uh, from a different uh, viewer, uh, what about fruits? Yeah, fruits can be absolutely great. Um, I love giving my dogs berries, especially frozen blueberries. Frozen fruit in the summer is really, really nice. Um, in terms of fruit, I know you want to stay away from things like uh, avocado. Um, you want to stay away from cherries. Definitely grapes, which can be very dangerous for animals to consume. But yeah, especially berries. Um, I love giving apples as well. And I also love hearing my dogs eat a crunchy apple. It's very <laughs> soothing for some reason. <laughs> so yeah, lots of great uh, different options when it comes to fruit. Okay, next one. Uh, I tried introducing carrots and other vegetables into their food, but my dog is really good at picking around that. How do I get my dog to eat some of these veggies? <laughs> That's funny. Some of them are, you can't get anything past them. Like if you have kids and you're trying to sneak veggies into their food. Um, something you might be able to do is maybe blend it up. Maybe having it in more of like a, a, a pureed form or adding it to something more liquidy can make it more palatable for them. So maybe uh, disguising it and depending on how you're feeding, it might be easier than others. So like if you're feeding a wet food or a freeze dried raw um, or a frozen type of food, it would be easier to disguise that. But I would encourage you breaking it down and maybe mixing it into something else. Okay, next question. Can changing protein upset your dog's stomach? So some animals, just like people, can be very sensitive to changes. And of course, some uh, may have some uh, sensitivities or allergies to specific proteins. But generally speaking, um, if that's really not an issue for your pet, uh, the risk of uh, upset is pretty low. But it's always encouraged that um, you do transition again this is if you're moving from uh, a different brand essentially to do a transition period of at minimum five days where you're incorporating the new food and the old food and you're gradually uh, decreasing the amount of the old food until you get to 100 percent of the new food another thing that you can do um, to ease transition again from another brand or like a very different product category is adding something like a probiotic supplement or um, pumpkin, something that helps uh, with overall GI health and something like pumpkin, which is particularly high fiber to kind of prevent any digestive upset. But once again, you're in, let's say you're feeding open farm dry food and you're feeding the white fish and you want to go to beef, there's really no need to transition um, to for a transition period when rotating between proteins. Okay. Next question. Is corn safe for dog diets? So I think this is something that's quite debated, but generally speaking, um, in the pet food world, corn can be seen as more of a filler ingredient in that it's not so easy for them to digest. 
just like it's not the easiest thing for humans to digest if you get my drift. <laughs> um, but it also doesn't just just doesn't carry that many nutritional benefits either. So in my opinion, I think that there are other plant-based ingredients that carry with them um, more nutritional benefits. Like if you're looking at something, um, maybe some field peas or some chickpeas um, or lentils, which will carry some protein with them as well as some other nice vitamins and minerals. Okay. Uh, next question. Is there a list of items for bowl building? So I guess the question would be, do, do, does your organization have like a list that you could provide to attendees about items that would be a good idea for bowl building? Yeah. So um, I think this is my old my old presentation, but um, yes, we absolutely do. So if uh, that's something that we could, I could totally follow up on um, for anybody that's interested, but a great resource is going to www.openfarmpet.com. And on there, you can kind of browse the different mediums for bowl building. Um, but again, just keep in mind the elements of bowl building, starting with your complete and balanced base, um, and adding your complementary items and supplements. And uh, again, you can add your finishing touches in your own kitchen if you wish as well. So I would say check out our website. And um, Greg, if anyone would like follow up to that, I can provide a listing of the things that we talked about today. Okay. Uh, next question. How frequently should you change your dog foods brand throughout the year? So that's a, that's a good question. Um, and I'm not exactly sure I have a definitive answer to that because I would say I wouldn't necessarily change it up like, uh, you know, once a month, but maybe every few months or so. And as long as you see that they're tolerating the rotation quite easily, I would say that you could maintain that frequency. So I would say, you know, give them time to go through a bag and uh, see that they're properly digesting it and maybe a few months later rotate a brand um, to kind of get the different nutritional benefits and uh, just exposing them to the different formulas that different manufacturers offer. Okay. Uh, next question. What about organic food? How important is it to feed organic foods? So this is also a question that I get quite often. And I think a lot of times people associate organic with being healthier. And in some cases, you definitely have your benefits, especially when you're considering that certain fruits and vegetables are part of what they call the dirty dozen, which they say you really should buy organic. Um, but then you have your other uh, produce items that they say because of you know their composition or their cell wall they're really not so susceptible to pesticides and herbicides so it's not absolutely necessary necessary to buy them in organic um, so what I would say is maybe focus on like the dirty dozen list for organic produce if you don't want to buy everything organic um, I personally like organic just because it can um, lead to greater soil health and sustainability is something that's really important to me. Um, and there's a theory that because of the greater soil health that it may cause the nutrients to be a bit more robust and organic versus conventional. But I think that's something that's kind of left up to interpretation. So that's what I would recommend as a starting point um, at minimum focusing on something that's non-GMO. Sounds great. Well, that concludes our Q&A for tonight. Well, thank you, Sonia, for the presentation and fielding all these questions. Uh, we hope everyone enjoyed the, the program. Um, if you have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to Cherry Brook, and we'd be happy to connect you with a nutritional expert. Uh, this webinar has been recorded and will be posted to our company's website in about two days. And we'll be sending a link to that uh, to all of our attendees tonight. So thank you so much, Sonia. We appreciate your time today. Thank you all so much for joining and thanks for hanging in with me the first minute. Bye. Bye-bye.